Hi, I'm Keith Ghostland. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. It's Tuesday, May 5th, and we are taping in Montpelier, which is unceded indigenous land. Let's start with some headlines, beginning with Keith. Well, hello. Hi, Keith. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Ah, gracias. I, I, I dressed as a pinata just for you. So, this week's trivia question. In the past, we've talked about Ron Squires being the first openly LGBTQ plus person elected to statewide office when he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1990. However, was there any other LGBTQ plus person who might have been serving openly in state government prior to that? And I do have an answer. So just a little plug, the census, if you haven't done it, please do. It could mean as much as $4,300 per Vermonter counted. And some of the information that was just put out is that after the 2010 census, Vermont lost more in federal aid than any other state because of underreporting. And the estimate is that we lost approximately $2,500 per Vermonter. This is money that even though on the federal level they're trying to ignore us, once the money comes to Vermont, the LGBTQ plus community has a presence, we can decide or help decide how that money is get used. The other plug is vital in your health records. If you don't know what they're getting in for information, you need to talk to your provider and find that out. I'm gonna talk a little bit about events this week. And then I'm gonna talk about the legislature. They've passed several bills that are of interest to us and that we're gonna to wanna to follow. So Linda, it's All your turn. Right. I'm up now. Well, the first thing I was gonna talk about was um, that little uh, snafu with uh, Pence at the hospital. Um, not wearing a mask. And then two people are arrested, uh, two women, two men were arrested, uh, two women, uh, transgender women were uh, murdered in Puerto Rico. And I'll have a little more about that. An Indian, an Indiana restaurant, the Fiddlehead, is offering pickup during the quarantine, and they are doing so in style with full makeup and high heels. And I have a picture of them uh, doing their food out in front of the restaurant. So I hope you enjoy that picture. Anderson Cooper becomes a dad, and he said as a gay kid, he never thought it was possible, so he is really thrilled. Mrs. America and the Truth About Her Son John, which is a little thing about Phyllis Shafley, um, and a fired a Georgia fire chief sues for anti-trans discrimination. Gay former ambassador Rufus Guilford was named as Biden's deputy campaign manager. Guilford, as we remember, was the gay ambassador to Denmark during the Obama administration. Queer singer Jamie Wyatt defines outlaw country as a music category. Um, in Ohio, Chairman McGuffey, who sued Sheriff Jim Nell over her firing, will succeed him as sheriff if she is elected in November. She, however, wa walloped him in the primaries, so good luck to her. North Carolina police are searching for missing same-sex couple. Fred Rogers advised, advised, advised Officer Clemens to stay closeted and to marry a woman. And Harvey Milk Terminal is open at the San Francisco airport. And Puerto Rican pro volleyball player, Dennis Dell, Vale, comes out as gay. So we'll have a little more about that coming up. 
And? I have a page worth of headlines. <laughs> they are as follows. And I've organized it by continent. And what I found interesting about this uh, pattern of organization is that some countries are in part like Russia is 77% Asian and 23% European, but you know, I've rounded up to the continent that has the majority. Africa is pretty clear uh, what continent that is. And I have my, my headlines before me. Dozens of gay men are outed in Morocco as photos are spread online. And this is a story I reported on last time. Much more has come out about it. It's continuing and I'm gonna explore it in detail this week. Uh, another story I mentioned last time that I'd like to clarify a bit about, 19 Uganda LGBT members denied bail after public gathering arrest. I reported last time that they were arrested for people, you know, now it emerges that four people were not arrested because they were sick. I reported erroneously that they were freed, but they haven't been. They're, they've been in jail since they were arrested and um, given no recourse, uh, the hearing is gonna be May 12th, but it's clearly discriminatory. Um, Kenyan court, this is a familiar story, the fight about Rafiki, the release of the lesbian film Rafiki continues. The director appealed once again to lift the ban on the film and the Kenyan government has denied her appeal. So it's gonna stay banned in Kenya for a while, but I'm sure she'll appeal again. In Latin America, actually Central America, uh, there's a Tijuana shelter protecting LGBTQ immigrants from the coronavirus. And this is a particular, uh, it's of particular interest because uh, it's one of the few in the country, in Mexico that is. Uh, moving on to Asia, and here's something to celebrate. Taiwan records over 3,500 gay marriages at the end of March. The Thai Constitution, um, the Constitutional Court rejects a marriage law petition. And I have a picture now before you of the complainants, two, uh, one gay male couple and one lesbian couple posing in, at the courthouse with their representatives. So I think these petitions are gonna continue. The Philippines just denied one also, but it's gonna, you know, it's going to percolate and it's going to keep going until, you know, I'm hopeful there'll be progress. Japan, uh, a company uh, has agreed to accept same-sex partner certificates by uh, an NGO. Um, so that's progress. The corporate um, interests of Japan are moving forward with equality, uh, even though the government is dragging its heels. Um, uh, this is a miserable story. A poll released in Russia this week found that 32% of respondents want to isolate gay men and lesbians from society. So, um, in better news in Israel, a court rules against a Beersheba print shop that refused to serve an LGBT group. So um, university LGBT um, group brought their poster to this print shop and the uh, religious owner said, you're an abomination and so forth. But the, the court said too bad. You know, if, if you're performing a public service, you have to serve everybody. Israel also is going to postpone its gay pride march, LGBT pride march, until later in the summer, they say. So that puts them in step with the rest of the world in that regard. Um, now let's move on to Europe. Um, the EU 
is urged to act as Hungary's far right government moves to end legal recognition of trans people. Um, and this is, you know, a repressive move couched in the coronavirus pandemic uh, action. Anti-gay lawyer um, loses appeal to Europe's top court. This is an Italian lawyer who was a shock rock disc jockey who said that, um, you know, gay people, you shouldn't hire gay people, it's bad. And he was uh, reprimanded, he was sued by a gay group. Um, and the suit was upheld, but then he appealed his um, complaint to the um, high court of the EU, which said, no, 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 and fined him again for court costs. So now he's going back to the Italian Supreme Court, but he really is uh, standing on very um, fragile legal ground. The Turkish president, another deplorable, supports a homophobic Muslim cleric who said that um, homosexuality is against Islam. Uh, he gave this as his first sermon in Ramadan. And then the Turkish president said, if you criticize him, you criticize the Islamic State. So. Uh, Finland, better news, Finland has celebrated, confirmed the first two same-sex adoptions. Single men, single women, pairings, they have each adopted a child. On to Britain with a lot of news. A transgender man in the UK loses his appeal to be listed as a father. And I have a picture of him before you now. Uh, if you saw the documentary Seahorse, um, he was the star. His name is Freddie McConnell. He gave birth after transitioning, unsuccessfully appealed the court decision that he could be registered only as the son's mother. Because he, he stopped his transition and had this child and then resumed it and is a man now, but the court said that uh, the word mother reflects a biological relationship, not a gender identity. So um, if you wanna see his story, tune in to Seahorse. It was at the Tribeca Film Festival um, last year. And there's a lot of concern in the UK. Uh, LGBT campaigners are concerned over the government plan to protect under 18 trans people from what the um, equality minister called irreversible gender decisions. So that is um, the um, equality minister is presiding over uh, review of the two, 2004 Gender um, Recognition Act. And she made this statement while saying the results are gonna be released in summer. So people are worried about that. She's also been sparring with the LGBT community because she's International Trade Commissioner and um, has been urged to sever trade agreements with uh, country with homophobic countries that have anti-LGBT laws on the books. And so that she's engaged with the debate about that too. Um, three more stories from England. The M15 boss apologizes for historic homophobic persecution of the intelligence staff. He says it must have caused all kinds of hurt and it did. So he's retiring, but that's his parting statement. Although he started, um, he enrolled in the agency while it was still going on. And it was finally ended in 1991 by um, Prime Minister Major. All right, um, more bad news. And this was last week. Um, 
this was report was uh, launched in honor in recognition of Lesbian Visibility Week. A third of lesbian mothers have been pelted with vile homophobia at school gates from other parents, the study has found. <clears throat> and finally, and excitingly for some of us, London Fashion Week is going gender neutral and virtual. And I'm going to talk about that in detail, but I have a picture now before you of some gender neutral and virtual models for London Fashion Week. So those are my lengthy headlines. Um, I won't be able to talk about all of them, but that's what's going on in the world as I see it. Let's move now to Keith. Well, hello. Oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what I would like to talk about are a few events. And I really want to encourage people to go online. And as Anne is about to promote Fashion Week being a virtual event, what are the virtual events that are happening here in Vermont for which you can participate? Because as we were talking before we started taping this show, we're kind of ready to bolt for freedom and would like to talk to someone other than ourselves. And some of us are learning how to cut our own hair before warned. So one of the events that's happening is being sponsored by the Pride Center and it's a virtual community gathering and it happens every day, Monday through Thursday, it happens at 5.30 p.m. And on Friday, it happens at 1.30 p.m. And I'm told that for the 5.30 p.m. events at 5.45, there's a Jeopardy contest using Amazon Echo. You know, Professor Charles could be challenged for her knowledge of trivia. So, and you can access that by going onto the Pride Center site, looking at their events. I've noticed a number of things that are sort of in the works. There is a group in White River Junction that I think they're very optimistic, but they want to do a Pride event in July. And they've started some organizing, some conversations. We may be reaching out to them to see exactly what it is they're planning and how we might be able to participate. And along that same line, Bennington Pride, which last year held their first Pride event, parade a weekend long series of events in June, which is when most states do celebrate Pride. They've already announced that this year they, they're doing it as a virtual event. So if we go onto their website, we can see how we could participate or see the activities that Queer Connect in Bennington is supporting. And then there is also Out in the Open, which does a, a radio hour that talks about LGBTQ issues, which is a source of information and interaction during this time of self-isolation. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Linda. Well, um, you know, that sounds like a lot of fun. And um, I, I was always, I was wondering whether <clears throat> we would get to do our 4th of July again this year, but probably not, but we'll see <clears throat> how things progress by then. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the journalist who covered, um, Vice President Pence, when he visited Mayo Clinic last week, says that he's now being punished for revealing that visitors were told to wear masks on the trip there and that um, everybody on the plane and everybody knew, despite the fact that uh, Pence's wife apparently said on Fox News um, that, you know, he was unaware of it. Um, and uh, so that has been proven to not be true. I don't know why he would do that. Um, but anyway, um, that seems to be what happened. And um, 
two women, were, two people, two men were arrested in the killing of two transgender women in Puerto Rico. Serena Angelique Velasquez and Leila Pelleyes were visiting from New York City. The two men were handed over to the FBI who are handling this case. I hope to have more on what happens to them, um, you know, and if they're going to trial or being convicted or anything. <clears throat> and if anybody's been watching Mrs. America, I, we haven't been able to see it because we don't have um, the station it's on, but it's about Phyllis Shafley and her fight against the ERA. And in it, <clears throat> her son is gay. His name is John. And, um, you know, she, and uh, so the series is called Mrs. America and it's on Hulu. In the series, probably um, a, a trick or, or a date or something of um, Shafley's son, George, uh, John, uh, rings the doorbell and blackmails, blackmails her for her silence about John. Apparently this isn't true and it's imagined by the people who are doing this series, but her son is gay and was publicly outed in QW in 1992. He is, however, and remains a big supporter of his mother and he feels like what she's doing or what she did was right. And it seems like, <clears throat> if I've heard correctly, uh, Phyllis's uh, daughter is also taking her mother's place as another Mrs. America. Um, it, uh, let's see. Queer singer Jamie Wyatt defines outlaw country music as a category. At 21, she ended up in prison after robbing her heroin dealer. And much of her experience is a chron chronicle in her first album called Felony Blues. Today, Wyatt says she is in a good place, is sober, not taking drugs, and is eager to connect with the queer community. So we're kind of looking forward to hearing that album. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a little Johnny Cash. I guess there's a whole bunch of people who are considered outlaw um, country western singers and um i guess johnny cash would be one and um you know so and and there's probably a bunch of them but anyway um so we look forward to that so now i think we're going to move on to ann uh and uh see what she has to say about what's going on in the world okay i have some things to add um apropos of virtual pride Israel's going to do that too. And so Linda is is outlaw country progressive country? Yeah, it's progressive country. It's well country rock or but it is definitely country in the country music genre. And she is a country music singer. Okay, and an outlaw. Yes. And the, you know, there are many on, I can't think of anything besides Johnny Cash, but there was quite a few that were kind of, uh, well, you know, uh, Willie Nelson might be considered an outlaw. Um, what about country. Brandy Carlisle? Is she a country singer? Um, I don't know. I can't answer that. I don't think so. Okay. Well, we're out of our league now, so let's move <laughs> on. Um, I'd like to talk in detail, if I may, about this mess in Morocco. Um, at least 50 to 100 gay men were outed in Morocco over the last two weeks, rights activists say, after the men were identified on location-based meeting apps while sheltering at home amid the coronavirus knock lockdown. Um, in at least three cases, the men were kicked out of their houses, um, Many others f said they had been blackmailed and threatened, and thousands fear that their photos will spread on social media. Uh, one, a young man whose photos were leaked online said, I'm just waiting for my death sentence. 
I'm frustrated and scared. As we know in Morocco, um, a Northern African kingdom where homosexuality and sex outside marriage are crime, gay people are painfully accustomed to the feelings of peril and rejection, and many keep their sexual identities under wrap. Um, what happened, however, is on April 13th, a Moroccan transgender Instagram personality based in Istanbul, whose name is Nafual Musa or Sofia Taluni, was insulted about her sexual orientation. In a rage, she released a profanity-laced video encouraging women to download the location-based meeting apps like Grindr and Planet Ro Romeo, which are usually used by gay men. I gave you a garbled version of this story last time, but this, these are the details. Um, in subsequent videos, she said her aim was to reveal the hypocrisy of Moroccan society by showing her attackers how many gay men were living in their vicinity, perhaps even in their own homes. Many people followed her lead and created fake accounts on the apps to gather photos of gay men, which they then posted on private and public Facebook pages, setting off homophobic attacks. Um, Adam Eli, the founder of the New York-based activist group Voices4, worked in coordination with Moroccan LGBTQ rights activists to get the Instagram account deleted. Um, a spokesperson for Facebook, which owns Instagram, confirmed, we don't allow people to out members of the LGBTQ community because it puts them at risk. We've disabled Nafal Musa's Facebook and Instagram accounts, and we're taking proactive steps to find and remove other content like this. What seems to have set Ms. Musa off was a late night conversation with a little known Instagram user who in an interview asked to be identified only as Yasin for fear for his safety. Um, she became, has become famous as an Instagram personality uh, using her platform to talk crudely about sex and to entertain followers in, an, in, in a confrontational and insolent manner in vulgar Moroccan Arabic. This has made her an object of fascination and horror for more than her half million followers. She is known to despise LGBTQ people who, who do not make their sexual orientation known. Yassin, the 22-year-old, said he was initially delighted to be picked up on her Instagram, but what felt like an honor rapidly turned into embarrassment and shock as she compelled him to acknowledge that he was gay, threatening to post revealing photos showing him with another gay man. It's unclear how she obtained the photos. Um, I was shocked and very scared. He has since been forced to move out of the house of a family member and to use his savings to rent a small apartment in Tangier. Everybody is sending the video and saying bad things about me, he said. My mom also, she's very sad. She's not talking to me anymore. My friends at the gym, friends I went to school with, they all blocked me. Many who saw the outing of Yassine were outraged and attacked Ms. Musa, flagging her account to Instagram. That's when she got angry and suggested downloading gay meeting apps, which led to the outburst of anti-gay violence. So that's a creepy, terrible story that's still having repercussions. I have two more quick points, unless you want me to move on. All right, I'll move on since no one's silencing me. Um, I'd like to go to Latin America now to this um, Tijuana shelter. And I'd like to show you a picture now um, of three people. From left is the Organization for Refuge, Asylum, and Migration Executive Director Stephen Roth with Jaime Marin Roca and his mother, 
uh, Yolanda Roca of Jardin de las Mariposas, and that's the name of the shelter. And this is significant because um, Yolanda Roca is the founding member and her son Jaime is the executive director. There are local media reports that there are um, more than 400, I'm sorry, 500 coronavirus virus cases in the uh, border city. Mexico responded very late. The city's now under lockdown and the U.S. has, you know, it's terrible down there. Um, the U.S. has temporarily stopped asylum seekers, as we know, from entering the U.S. The Mexico-U.S. border is only open for essential traffic. Jardín de las Mariposas is a nonprofit organization founded by Yolinda Roca, the person pictured above before you. Um, she's the current director, and he uh, holds another uh, another post uh, in support of the organization. Um, it's always, it always receives anyone who seeks to help with addiction or emotional problems because of their sexual orientation with love, respect, and without cost. It's the only center in Tijuana that openly welcomes the LGBTQ community. Um, the organization has lately focused on providing help to asylum seekers and refugees because of the increased immigration to the U.S. Um, is uh, Juan Jaime Marine Roca is the shelter's legal representative and his mother's the director. And the other person, Stephen, Steve Roth, is um, an ally who has helped raise money for them. Unfortunately, there are only 20 people and they've had to close their doors because a lot of the um, residents are HIV positive, have cancer, they're at risk. And, um, but anyway, that's a, a bastion of hope in Tijuana. Um, I have one more, um, one more picture I'd like to show you of um, the Gender Recognition Act supervisor, whose name is Liz Truss. This is her picture. And she's the one who has, um, caused a lot of concern by announcing or saying that she's concerned about trans youth doing irreversible damage to themselves if they're under 18. Um, so those are my stories for this segment. I have much more to talk about, but I think it's time for me to reluctantly yield the floor or happily we yield the floor to Keith. Hello. And I want to talk a little bit about our legislature and some political process here in Vermont. I want to start with, if you haven't heard and you haven't gotten an appeal yet, that openly lesbian Chittenden County Senator Debbie Ingram has officially announced she is running for lieutenant governor. Along those same lines, there was a Zoom community meeting with two other candidates running, also running on the Democratic Party for Lieutenant Governor, and they were Zoom bombed. One of the candidates, Brenda Siegel, is a Jewish woman. And the person who bombed their meeting use profanities and put swastikas up on their site. Brenda said this was very unnerving in this current time. And as an aside, the Southern Poverty Law Project has stated there has been a dramatic increase in bias and hate motivated crimes during the COVID-19 stay at home orders that 
all of that activity has become much more active. So some pieces of legislation here in Vermont that will be of interest to us. The Senate passed S-346. This is a bill that would provide additional payment to people who are identified as being essential workers. And if someone works more than 108 hours per month, they would get an additional $1,000. And if someone worked at least 34 hours a month, they would get an additional $600. Now the 34 hours per month was of interest to me. That would, could be someone who is identified as an essential healthcare worker for somebody with disabilities who needs some daily assistance, but not necessarily a full shift. So they're looking at the type of interaction and ensuring everybody is covered in this. The other piece of legislation that's actually passed both chambers is S333, which would impose a statewide moratorium on rent evictions and foreclosures. This is something that people have talked about. There's also some landlords who have released information saying, I'm giving my tenants a rent holiday, knowing that these are financially stressed time for them. So, so this bill is on its way to the governor's desk. There's every indication that he is indeed going to sign it. Uh, some other pieces of information that will be of interest to us is that Department of Health Commissioner Levine has announced that they're going to do contact tracing and they are going to do more of it. And as opposed to how the federal regime may have approached this, what Commissioner Levine has done is reached within his own department and specifically to the epidemiology division where they have expertise doing this relative to HIV infections and STDs. They know how to take a history, they know how to develop a contact list, and they are well-trained at how to do sensitive and informative outreach. This is one of those cases where indeed Vermont got it right. So, and the other thing that Commissioner Levine share during a recent press conference is they're going to start doing some random trace, uh, random sampling. So if you get a strange phone call that says it's from the Department of Health or a letter in the mail saying we want to invite you to come and have a COVID-19 antibody test, it's actually legitimate. It's not the same as some of the pop-up bogus clinics that had happened in the South where they said they were doing a sampling and all they were doing was taking your money. What this will provide to Vermont, and I haven't seen where they've established the number of Vermonters they're looking for, but it's a random sampling statewide, and what it will hopefully provide is an indication of virus prevalence in the state of Vermont because there is an epidemiological formula that can be employed where you have X number of positives out of X number of samples taken, and that gives you an indication of community spread or the likelihood of community spread. So that's what I had. So I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda. Well, you know, that's really good news. I was reading or I saw someplace that they're using sewers to sort of test whether an area has um, the coronavirus or not, too. Because um, I guess if there's, depending on how much there is in the sewer system, tells you somewhat about how much is in the community, which was kind of interesting, I thought. Um, but that's good news, and I'm glad we're moving in that direction. Um, so I have a little story about Mr. Rogers and um, his neighborhood. <laughs> and um, 
for anybody who has watched Mr. Rogers or has watched with children, um, there was a policeman on there called Officer Clemens. He was African American and he was advised by Fred Rogers to be closeted and to marry a woman because um, it would be better for him. Um, but he didn't. And for 25 years, Rogers was one of the most watched shows by children. And um, these children have known Officer Clemens on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, um, you know, for 25 years. And um, so that's the story about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, Anyway, and, and I watched this um, show on Netflix called Circus of Books. I don't know if anybody has seen it, but it's um, a documentary about the history of LGBTQ media and censorship. The store was owned by Karen and Barry Mason. Uh, and they distributed uh, primarily uh, gay men erotica in their store and so it centered on this store that was in uh, West Hollywood where apparently there were a lot of gay people in the um, in years past and uh, it's called Circus of Books and it's really interesting they um, and their son comes out as gay uh, you know, at the end of the film, or is it the end of the documentary? But it was really interesting. Um, they were both Jewish, and um, she was really religious. He wasn't. Um, and when her son came out, even though they were people who were doing this, you know, giving LGBTQ people places to go and get, you know, uh, erotica and to, you know tapes and films and magazines. When her son came out, she had a really hard time with it. Um, and um, so it was, it was kind of interesting. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, so I would suggest if you have Netflix, you might want to watch that. So that's all that I have, I believe, um, having to do with national news at the moment. I hope everybody is uh, safe and um there's a lot of good films and documentaries out there, so keep yourselves busy. And I think I will now move on. We heard the sewer story on Rachel Maddow. Okay, um, I'd like to focus for a minute, if I may, on London Fashion Week. And I'd like to show you the picture again of the uh, non-binary models. For the next 12 months, all London Fashion Weeks will fuse women wear and men wear to create a single gender neutral platform. As the fashion world scrambles to adapt to the consequences of the coronavirus pandemic, the British Fashion Council has announced that for the next 12 months, all London Fashion Weeks will fuse women wear women's wear and men's wear to create a single gender neutral platform according to an April 21st press release. Beyond opting for a less rigidly gendered format, the British Fashion Council also stated that the June edition of the London Fashion Week will now occur through an online portal featuring interviews, podcasts, designer diaries, webinars, and digital showrooms. The current pandemic is leading us all to reflect more poignantly <coughs> on the society we live in and how we want to live our lives and build businesses when we get through this, said Carolyn Rush, the chief executive of the British Fashion Council. The other side of this crisis, we hope will, about, will be about sustainability, creativity, and product that you value, respect, and cherish. By creating a cultural fashion week platform, we are adapting digital innovation to best fit our needs today and something to build on 
as a global showcase for the future. Um, the BFC's decision to make London Fashion Week gender neutral marks the first instance in the biannual events 37 year history that shows would not be separated along binary lines of menswear and women's wear. M.I. Leggett, designer of the gender free label official rebrand, designer of impact, um, I'm sorry, the main positive impact of BFC's decision, according to B.M.I. Uh, Leggett, promises to be the setting of a simple, though fundamental precedent. By not saying women's buyers, women's press, you go here, and men's buyers, men's press, you go there, BFC is breaking down the binary, um, deeply entrenched in these business structures. They they tell them, which is the, uh, them is a publication. As British Vogue reports, the BFC's decision to move London Fashion Week online reflects the broader fashion industry's increasing willingness to employ non-traditional modes of interacting with fans and potential customers. So this is a very interesting development. It'll be interesting. I hope it lasts longer than 12 months, but we'll see. All right, so on to Keith. I've given all that I had to share this week. What about the trivia question? Okay, if we're done with the stories, yes, indeedy, I have the answer <laughs> to the trivia question. I believe we're finished. Okay, so Ron Squires was elected to the House of Representatives in 1990 and is generally acknowledged as being the first openly LGBTQ plus person elected to a statewide office. However, he wasn't necessarily the first openly LGBTQ plus person to serve in state government. In 1985, Madeline Kunin appointed openly gay attorney David Curtis as Vermont's Defender General. David Curtis would go on to form the Curtis Hoff Law Practice with former Governor Bill Hoff. And as sort of a background piece, Defender General is the state agency that is comparable to the Office of Attorney General. Only what the Defender General does is has oversight and provides guidance to public defenders. They're looking out for the interest of the people who are the defendants who have been charged with a crime by the state of Vermont, as opposed to the Office of State's Attorney and Attorney General, who is the prosecutor in those cases. And in one of my conversations with David Curtis, he acknowledged that Governor Kunin, when she appointed him, was aware that he was an openly gay man, and her only concern was, can you do the job? And Anne has something she would like to add. I know, if you, since we have time, one story, national story that we have uncovered, Linda, is the um, victory of activism in New York City in the form of Franklin Graham's Oh, that's yeah. Samaritan's Purse finally agreeing to leave Central Park. Can you tell us a little more about that, Linda? Well, actually, no, I didn't. Um, I didn't get to that story for some. But if you know anything more about it, you can. Sh if you wouldn't mind freely sharing it with us, that would be great. I know they're gone. <laughs> I've been following it closely, and um, first of all, Saint John the Divine. They were supposed to. Uh, coordinate with St. John the Divine, and they said, no, no, you don't reflect our values. They had a contract with the openly gay head of um, um, Mount Sinai in New York. And, you know, of course, they had the statement of um, faith that they required their volunteers to yeah, sign. Yeah, we, 
we did kind of cover a little of that last time. All right. Well, I won't go back into that. But Reclaim Pride and other New York activists have been demonstrating there. And they confronted Mayor, one of, I believe, one of our mentors, Andy Helm, participated in confronting Mayor de Blasio about this. And de Blasio's wife is bisexual. Um, and he was like, oh, oh. So finally, uh, and I, this is exciting because it's a victory of activism. Um, Samaritan's Purse has agreed to leave Central Park within two weeks and they're fumigating and everything um, because they were, you know, there was another deal that was going to happen with Beth Israel involving Samaritan Purse's um, infiltration of that hospital system. But it's all been called off and it, it just shows that activism works. I don't know how this deal with the devil happened to begin with, but now it's been cut short and I have to commend our activist friends in New York for making it happen. Yes, and it shows that we can even do it. We can even, we can even win during these times of act, uh, be, by being activists. Okay, I think we have to sign off now, don't we? Yes, we do. So Linda, take us home. Okay, be safe, be healthy. We'll see you in two weeks. And in the meantime, like they did in New York, resist. resist. Thank you.